Hey friends, I'm Crystal Bessie with the Louisiana Farm to School program. This month's Louisiana Harvest of the Month was grown by our nation's first president, George Washington. It's a root, but its leaves are also edible. Have you guessed it? It's sweet potatoes. Now let's learn a little more about the sweet potato, a vegetable with a history as colorful as its bright orange flesh. Another George Washington was fond of sweet potatoes and the farmers who grow them. George Washington Carver was a prominent agricultural scientist and inventor in the 1900s. He developed hundreds of products with sweet potatoes like flour, ink, starch, vinegar, and even glue for postage stamps. Today, we're here in Baton Rouge with Allison Guidros, owner of Fullness Farms, and Dr. Don Labonte, has come to visit us as well from LSU Ag Center. He's gonna teach us a little bit more about sweet potatoes and how to grow them. This is Dr. Don Labonte, and he's gonna tell us a little bit more about Louisiana sweet potatoes. He's a sweet potato breeder and a geneticist at the LSU Ag Center, and he's closely involved in the development of new sweet potato varieties. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, thanks, Crystal, for having me. Yeah, so would you like to tell us a little bit more about um, sweet potatoes? Well, let's see. Let's start out by talking about a little bit about Louisiana sweet potatoes. You know, I think we always think of those as um, being some of the best out there in the world. Of course. And so I think it's really that. Um, care they take in producing the crop. That's a big deal. And when you harvest it, you do something called curing where you kind of warm them up, you add, put them in a hot room after you've harvested them, and that increases the sugar content. And they're really good about doing that. And then you put them in this cold storage. So it's kind of a complicated crop to um, care for once you've harvested it. And so that even when you put it in that cooler temperature, it actually starts to increase the sugars again. So what's kind of neat is a lot of times our harvests are in that September, October period. And so when we get to that Thanksgiving holiday period when that's when everyone buys sweet potatoes, they're at their ultimate flavor. So they're just really, really good. So everyone says, yeah, these sweet potatoes are the best. And so I agree with them. Yeah. <laughs> sweet potatoes are so beautiful in color. So um, tell me a little bit more about uh, how, how the color works. Yeah, that's kind of a, that's one of those things that as I've been here for a number of years, I've really seen that develop far more. It used to be a, just eating an orange flesh sweet potato. Just give us a better one that yields more, better disease resistance. And now it's not so simple because we have different needs out there. So for instance, like if you go to California and our growers are starting to find this too, um, they want a red skin sweet potato because there's markets that love red skin sweet potatoes. You know what? The bio, the consumer wants it, you deliver it to them. And so we've had to develop um, new red skin sweet potatoes, which we think are, are quite attractive and, um, and actually eye appealing. And so that's something that we've been working on. We also surprisingly do a lot of work with white flesh sweet potatoes. This one has a little bit of a purple tinge to it, so it's kind of a, a, a really neat um, look to it. But white flesh sweet potatoes are actually what most of the world eats. They're about 90 Five percent of the world's production is actually white flesh sweet potatoes, not the orange types we eat. Can you tell me a little bit more about how to plant sweet potatoes? Sure. Are they easy to grow? If there is a tough plant out there, this is it. Um, sweet potatoes is probably the most um, indestructible plant. So if you don't have a green thumb, go for sweet potatoes. It works every time. And this is what the industry would plant. As you can see, there's absolutely no roots on that. You say, okay, that doesn't look like a very promising outcome, but really, if you look at each one of the, if you look at the base of each one of the leaves, you'll see some little tiny white bumps, and those little white bumps are going to turn into roots. And what's actually even neater is those little white roots that come out are going to form the storage roots. When you say storage root, do you mean that's yeah, the this, edible part Yeah, of this the is plant. what we call a storage root, is, okay. is that. Actually, when we do our research plots to evaluate these to find out which ones yields the most, um, we'll actually still just use a, um, a broom handle to put them in the ground. And so what we normally do is we will put 
Oh, that's nice soft ground. We'll put a nice hole in the ground like this. We'll then drop in a plant. Remember, it's these little joints where the vine, where the, where the leaves attached to the stem is going to be where the storage roots come out. We're going to put that in the ground. At least get two or three of those nodes in there. Go ahead and wow. collapse that in like that. You know what? It's ready to go. <laughs> it's that simple. And so as long as they have some water for about the first week, that's a big trick is because those little white emerging roots do need water. And if they have that for about a week, they are going to come out nicely as a nice story tree. Now, remember, sweet tails are kind of a tough crop. They don't really want a lot of fertilizer. They don't want a lot of nutrition. So it's almost kind of one of those things you ignore. Um, it will do better. So it's kind of like tomatoes. You ever fertilize tomatoes, you get a bunch of vines. If you ever fertilize sweet tails, you're going to get the same thing. Now let's head over to Judy and see what she's got cooking from the garden. I love sweet potatoes so much that I named one of my cats Sweet Potato. Not because he's orange, but because he's so sweet. Orange vegetables like sweet potatoes are good for you, so good for you that the USDA My Plate recommends eating four to five cups of orange vegetables a week. Here's a fun fact. The Spanish word for potato is papa or patata and the name for sweet potato is batata. I'm here with Allison and I have a few questions for you Allison. Great. Uh, I come from the north and I didn't ever see a sweet potato until I moved to Louisiana. Why do you think that is? Yeah, um, sweet potatoes need to grow in warmer climates. Another thing that I heard is that fresh sweet potatoes, right after you dig them out of the ground, aren't as good as sweet potatoes that have been cured. Why is that? Yeah, so in the curing process, the starches in the sweet potatoes get converted into sugar. So that's why they taste sweet. I think that's why I like them so much. I had my first sweet potato. It was a baked sweet potato when I first moved to Louisiana, and I've been hooked ever since. Louisiana sweet potatoes are an excellent source of beta carotene and it can supply you with great health promoting antioxidant phytonutrients. They're also a good source of dietary fiber, especially if you eat the skin. So what I like to do is show people ways that they can fix their sweet potato and keep the skin on. So what I'm going to show you right now is how I dice them. So notice that I cut the sweet potato so that there's a flat side so that I can just, it doesn't roll around on the um, cutting board. I'm going to trim off this root now, just slice. Like that and then turn a little stack. Then, and what you'll do is toss them with a little bit of olive oil, a little salt and pepper, put them on a tray and roast them up. Uh, we did a fun thing with the kids at the uh, Knock Knock Museum in Baton Rouge. We took sweet potatoes, we roasted them and they made little chips like this. Today we're going to show you a little bit of what we might do if we roasted some sweet potato wedges. Uh, you would put them on a plate with a little bit of salsa, some avocado, a squeeze of lime, and then give that a taste. So Allison, what we like to do is take one of these chips and dip it into the salsa, or you can use one of the wedges, one of the roasted wedges. Great! Thank you so much. Mmm! Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. So we could hear the little crunch and that sweetness along with the savory. Oh, that's mm -hmm. delicious. Did you know that a sweet potato is not the same as a white potato, like the kind used to make french fries? Sweet potatoes are actually the root of the plant. True potatoes are tubers, which are the enlarged or thickened portion of the underground stems of their plant. Thanks for joining us today to learn a little bit more about sweet potatoes. Now you can grow some in your own garden or cook some up in the kitchen.
Hi, I'm Crystal Bessie with the Louisiana Farm to School program. This month's Louisiana Harvest of the Month happens to be one of my favorite vegetables and it's a staple in southern cooking. It's greens. In the south, when we talk about greens, we're really referring to those dark green leafy vegetables that have been cooked until tender and eaten warm. Greens have held an important place on the southern table for over a century and they include collard greens, mustard greens, Swiss chard, and even kale. Let's learn a little more about what makes that vegetable so special. These leafy greens are distinct from much of the rest of the cabbage family because they do not form heads. Instead, their leaves are harvested. The oldest leafy greens within the cabbage family are collards, which were grown by the ancient Greeks and Romans. Mustard is another ancient plant with many uses, not only with those edible green leaves, but the seeds are used to make the condiment mustard. Today, India, China, and Japan are the main producers of mustard greens in the world, but a substantial amount are still grown in the United States. Swiss chard and spinach are members of the beet family, which includes beets and quinoa. Swiss chard originated in Sicily, Italy, where it remains popular across Europe. After the Civil War, the Swiss chard grew in popularity in the United States, and you can see why. Swiss chard is as nutritious as it is colorful. Varieties of Swiss chard have a rainbow of stem colors like red, pink, green, yellow, and even white. Think you don't like greens? Add a handful of spinach or Swiss chard to your favorite smoothie. Greens are a nutrient powerhouse that won't change the flavor. We're here at Fullness Farm in the heart of Baton Rouge, Louisiana with Allison Guidros. Thanks for having us today. You bet, it's great to have you out. Tell me a little bit more about what you grow here at Fullness and how you do it. Yeah, so we, um, like you said, we're in the city. And so we have a little bit of land here, an acre that we grow on. And um, we grow over 200 varieties of vegetables throughout the whole year. You may remember Allison from the Lettuce Harvest of the Month video. And she showed us lots of greens that they grow that you can eat raw. But today we're talking about cooking greens. So can you tell me about what you grow uh, for cooking greens? Yeah, I think that cooking greens are probably my favorite thing to grow and to eat. And so we grow a lot of different types. We have kale. Swiss chard, collard greens, and then we also have some things that people think about for the roots, but you can also eat the tops as well, like beets and even turnips. Is there a better time of year to grow these type of greens? Yeah, you know, we kind of think about our farming year starting around when school starts. So in August is the time that we'll seed the, the greens in our greenhouse where it's a little bit cooler. And then after about six weeks, we'll plant them in the ground. But the fall, when it's cooler, uh, that's when they grow the best. So how come they grow the best in the, in the cold? You would think that they wouldn't like the cold. Yeah, it's very interesting. Greens can actually take it down to a light frost. And when it freezes, they actually get sweeter because they produce a sugar that makes them not freeze, like antifreeze in your car. And so the greens will taste sweeter after a little frost. Once it starts getting warmer, the, uh, the greens will start putting up flowers and seeds, um, and then they don't taste as good as they do in the cooler months. Now let's head over to Judy and see what she's got cooking. Sounds great. Here we are among all the growing greens on Fullness Farm. We've got greens on radishes, greens on beets, we've got some what are these called? Yeah, this is two different types of kale. This one has a lot of names. Some people call it black kale, dino kale, Lassiano kale, and this one we just call it green curly kale. We've got some Swiss chard and some rainbow chard. Notice that the rainbow chard has a pink stem on it and the Swiss chard has a yellow stem. We've also got one of my favorites collard greens, and we're going to talk a lot about collard greens today. Greens, greens, greens. Did you know that these leafy green vegetables are some of the most nutritious foods that you can eat? They contain iron, potassium, and calcium, 
and are a good source of vitamins A, C, K, and folate. Here's a fun fact. These vegetables get their beautiful green color from a pigment called chlorophyll. It's a pigment that's in plant leaves that makes it possible for plants to absorb the sunlight to provide energy for photosynthesis. Its molecule contains a magnesium atom. Cook them and they turn bright green at first, but if you cook them a little bit longer, that magnesium is replaced and they change color. So this is the color that they change to. It's called pheophyton. It's kind of an olive green color. The first step in the recipe that I'm going to demonstrate is washing the greens and trimming the heavy stem. If you fold the green over like that and then take your knife and just slide it along like that, now you've trimmed out the stem with one cut, not two cuts. There are two ways that I usually work with greens. One is I might cut them up like I did for this dish right here. Another way is to do like they do in Brazil. And that is I roll them up like this and then I take my big knife right here and make some little greens that we're going to saute. With greens that have been cut into little squares like this, what I usually do is put them with a flavorful stock, maybe something with a little bit of tasso in it, uh, and simmer them until they're tender. And then I might add some other flavorful vegetables like onions or garlic or turnips. Today we have a sample of a recipe that was prepared and I'm going to have Allison taste test it. Pour a little of that tasty stock on them and then top it off with a little bit of pepper vinegar. Try that. Thank you so much. It's making my mouth water. <laughs> mm. Really, really good. Very good, very good. All right, let's go back into the field and learn more about growing greens. Did you know you can use the seeds from this frilly green leaf vegetable to make your own yellow mustard? Gather the mature seed pods from the mustard green stalks, let dry, then soak the seeds in vinegar and blend. So we're out here in the collard greens with Allison. Can you tell me a little bit more about how you harvest your, your greens out here? Yeah, definitely. So with a lot of the greens like collards, kale, mustard greens, Swiss chard, uh, one thing that's really great about them is you can plant it and then if you harvest it right you can get multiple harvests off of it so if you if you come down here with me you'll see that um, the smaller leaves are down here in the middle okay and so those are like the newer leaves exactly those are the newer leaves and so what we try to do is get the biggest leaves which will be closest down to the ground and on the outside and uh, with collards I really like it because you can just snap it off and I just go all around the plant and get uh, some of the biggest leaves from the bottom and leave that small, smaller leaves in the middle growing. And if you do it like this, you can get um, harvest off of this for months. We had some greens that we harvested off of for nine months. Can other greens be harvested this way? Yeah, other greens, can. we can do it the same way. Um, some of the, the cooking greens like we've been talking about today, they pretty much all can be harvested like that. And uh, you can see we have two rows of collards here, but um, you can see that we've got a large variety of different things. And um, we like doing like that and having a large diversity so that we get less pest pressure. And so um, in your own garden, it's nice if you have, you know, a lot of different types of greens, maybe some root vegetables, herbs, and uh, it makes it more fun to cook with as well. So just a few rows down from the collard greens, we're here with some beet greens. They're in the same family as Swiss chard, I believe. Is that correct, Allison? Yeah, that's exactly right, Crystal. They're the same family as uh, Swiss chard and spinach. And some people don't think about eating beet greens, but they are excellent. So uh, tell me a little bit more about what we have going on growing and how we can harvest this beet greens. Yeah, so we like to have a lot of variety, as we've talked about so much, and we will have a lot of variety even within one bed. So we grow several different types of beets here, 
And uh, we've got some really pretty ones right here. Um, I'll show you. Uh, this one is a purple bead, and it's a cylindrical shape. Wow. And then this one here, if you want to get it, okay. is um, it's pretty cool. When you, uh, when you oh wow, it. look at that color. Yeah, and if you cut it this way, it is candy cane striped, red yeah. and white striped. That's really fun. Yeah. We've had a great time out here at Fulness Farm today, learning all about greens. Allison, thank you so much for having us. You're welcome anytime. Hello everyone, I'm Martin McConnell. I am a longtime friend of LPB, and we hope that you are enjoying watching this broadcast of LPB's digital first series, Louisiana Harvest of the Month. You know, Louisiana certainly is a bountiful, bountiful place, and, and it's really fun learning about where our food comes from, don't you think? But we're taking this short break right now because we want to invite you to support programs such as this one by becoming a member of LPB. Please call us or, or text GIVE, that's GIVE, to 888-769-5000. Or you can go online to our secure server, that is lpb.org. Or, let's get really modern and technical here, simply scan that QR code that's on your screen right now. And uh, you're going to want to call, you're going to want to text, you want to click or scan right now because we have a member challenge right now. Member challenge to tell you all about. Our member, we, some of our members got together, Patricia Alford, Angela Corvers, Terry English, Neil Ferrari, and Andrea Stafford. And they're all from the greater Baton Rouge area. And they are proud to support the programming on LPB. And they're challenging all viewers, everyone, that's you, to donate right now and they will match the first $1,500 called in during this program only. That's going to be making your contribution really worth twice as much to LPB. And to thank you, why don't you take a look right now at all of the wonderful thank you gifts that we have for you for your pledge of support. For a $20 monthly donation, you will receive the Louisiana Harvest of the Month combo that includes the LPB Picnic Blanket, a pair of LPB Insulated Koozie Beverage Tumblers, locally produced honey from Fullness Farm, and a three-pound box of fresh-shelled Bajoran pecan halves. For $10 per month, receive a three-pound box of Bajoran pecan halves, or for just $7 per month, receive the LPB Picnic Blanket. You may choose not to receive a gift to let 100% of your donation go to support LPB. Simply call or text GIVE to 888-769-5000, give online at lpb.org, or scan the QR code on your screen with your smart device to become a friend of LPB today. And we are back, and we are very excited to have in the studio with us right now, from the Seeds to Success Louisiana Farm to School program, we have the executive director of that program, Dr. Carl Motzenbacher. Thank you for being here. And the program director, Ms. Crystal Bessie. Thank, Thank you me. so much for being here. I guess let's start out by finding out, t tell us a little bit about what is this program. Tell us about the uh, Louisiana Farm to School program, Seeds to Success. Okay, well, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, the Farm to School program is an educational program within the LSU Ag Center, and it has the three tenets of Farm to School, the first being school gardening, gardening programs at schools. The second is an educational piece um, referring to curriculum, and the third is procurement, so it's bringing local food product into schools. So that is basically the three tenets that we look at for farm to school and our program is actually a lot of different um, aspects to to that within the farm to school program and and what was the the germ of this if you will kind of what got it started in the first place well I, I've um, I, so I, I was brought to LSU to work with farmers and so I thought it would be a great avenue for farmers to have a um, more of a market for their products but also to teach people about where our food comes from and in particular children on how to eat better, how to appreciate fruits and vegetables in our diet and we have a term called food literacy that relates to this that everybody be, understands where our food comes from. And so uh, it, it's thanks to your program and to your assistance, uh, LPB has this great digital series. It's called Louisiana Harvest of the Month. 
and uh, you all are helping LPB put this together. So if you want to see more about that, you can go to lpb.org slash lpbdigital to be able to watch these programs. And each one, they're very, they're very short, but they're packed with information. Um, and, and each one's about 10 or 15 minutes mm -hmm. long. I think it's a wonderful thing. It's, we're, we're learning that more and more people are getting back to nature, back into gardening. Uh, they're, they're being more concerned about what they eat. And, and certainly any assistance from you all is, is very welcome. So tell me a little bit then about the work that you do with the schools and, the, and Seeds to Success. I mean, I'm, as program director, I guess that's kind of, <laughs> Crystal, that's kind of your thing, huh? Yeah, so um, our work with the schools, videos, these videos are just one component of that, and Harvest of the Month is, is also another, is a component that goes along right along with that. That's this Louisiana Harvest of the Month is our promotional program side of it, but we also have um, crop guides and gardening information on our website, and we also have lots of educational activities and lessons available on our website that are linked to the Louisiana student standards. So we try to cater to the teachers and the educators in our state who are teaching kids about where our food comes from, whether they're doing taste testing or whether they're having a garden or, or both. And um, in the past 12 months, we launched an in-classroom activity that where they can really experience uh, how seeds become plants and where our food comes from. and um, you know, maybe one day in the future some of these kids might decide they want to be a farmer or a producer um, as a result of this. Or even a backyard farmer like and I am. Absolutely. I mean, I, yeah. my wife and I, uh, we refer uh, a lot to the, the LSU Ag Center, the Cooperative Extension Service. I look at all of the publications. What should I be, like it's late February now and I'm reading, I promise you I'm reading, what should I be planting in my yes. garden right now? And that's thanks to the assistance of you. And you are finding out about this because it's thanks to you making your pledge of financial support, becoming friends of LPB, uh, you're the ones actually financing programs like this. And, and LPB is the only place in Louisiana you're going to find locally produced programs with local subjects. So let's learn a little bit about our thank you gifts. Let's go back again and, and learn how we say thank you for being a friend of LPB. For a $20 monthly donation, you will receive the Louisiana Harvest of the Month combo that includes the LPB Picnic Blanket, a pair of LPB Insulated Koozie Beverage Tumblers, locally produced honey from Fullness Farm, and a three-pound box of fresh-shelled Bajoran pecan halves. For $10 per month, receive a three-pound box of Bajoran pecan halves, or for just $7 per month, receive the LPB Picnic Blanket. You may choose not to receive a gift to let one 100% of your donation go to support LPB. Simply call or text GIVE to 888-769-5000, give online at lpb.org, or scan the QR code on your screen with your smart device to become a friend of LPB today. Hi friends, I'm Crystal Bessie of the Louisiana Farm to School Program. This month's Louisiana Harvest of the Month is grown in every U.S. state and every Canadian province. It became the official Louisiana State Fruit in 1980, and it's celebrated each year at its very own festival in Ponchatoula. It's strawberries. Join me and let's learn a little more about what makes this fruit the very best. Strawberries are a member of the rose family, which includes other fruit, like raspberries, cherries, and blackberries, and they give off a sweet fragrance when they grow. Wild strawberries can be traced back as far as the Romans, but they weren't commonly eaten because the fruit was small and they lacked flavor. It wasn't until an accident happened in a French garden when a larger Chilean species crossed with a small, flavorful North American species. The English further developed the modern strawberry and then they brought it to the Americas with them in the 1700s. Although you can grow a strawberry plant from seed, most strawberry plants will reproduce using runners, like this one that's a new clone growing on a horizontal stem of the plant. Strawberries are perennials, which means if you plant one, it will come back every year. Here in Louisiana though, farmers will grow them as an annual crop and replant them yearly to avoid disease issues. 
We're here in beautiful Springfield, Louisiana on this strawberry field and I'm here today with Trey Harris of Harris Farms. Thank you Thank so you. much for having us. I appreciate y'all coming out. Yeah, so tell me a little bit more about your farm. Well, we've, we've, we're up to 130,000 strawberry plants now. We have a little over nine acres of berries. We're located here in Springfield and I got into strawberry farming four years ago. Looks like you've got some great strawberry plants going. Yeah, we, we stay on top of it. We got five different varieties this year. Five varieties. Okay, so what varieties do you have? Uh, Florida Sensation, Camino Real, San Andrea, Festival, Benicia. Tell me a little bit more about when harvest season is here in Louisiana. We start here in November with some early uh, plants. It's called a plug plant, and we start picking on those in November, and then the other ones is called a bare root and it starts producing sometimes in early as December for us. Oh, okay, so you have strawberries ready maybe around Thanksgiving? Hopefully before Thanksgiving. When does your season end? Uh, we try to go to almost the beginning of June. We try to go a little longer. The people try to get to Mother's Day, uh, usually. Where can we find your berries? We package all our berries for Rouse's Market. They are a locally owned company here in Louisiana that's branched off into Mississippi and Alabama. We service New Orleans area, the Baton Rouge and Gonzales area, Denham, Punchtula, and the North Shore, Slidell, uh, Covington, and Mandeville. We have berries all over, and we own a business in downtown Punchtula where people drive up and get our berries every day um, at Harris Seafood in Punchtula. Now let's head over to Judy and see what she's got cooking from the garden. Hello, today we are among all these delicious strawberries. Red is my favorite color. Do you know that a half a cup of strawberries provides an excellent source of vitamin C? Eight strawberries will give you 100% of the RDA for vitamin C. They also contain vitamin A, iron, fiber, and folic acid. Here's a fun fact. On average, Americans eat more than three pounds of fresh strawberries each year, plus another almost two pounds of frozen strawberries. Strawberries start green, then they slowly turn red until they're the ripest and that's ready to pick. The color is called anthocyanin. It just changes as the strawberry ripens. Strawberries are used to make sweet dishes, but they can also be served in savory dishes. We make a wonderful strawberry salsa that has a spicy kick to it. They add color and fun to salads, cereals, and yogurt parfaits. Next time you have a salad, add some strawberries. Nothing compares to the sweet and slightly acidic taste of fresh strawberries, but let me show you a few quick and fun recipes that are a close second. Macerated strawberries served on little shortcakes here with a little whipped cream on the top. Pour some of that juice on top and a few strawberries. Oh, oh, oh. That looks good. Doesn't that look good? Oh, yeah. And then some whipped cream that we made in this in this jar. <laughs> there you go. Another thing I like to do is freeze some strawberries and put them in a glass so that they can act like ice cubes. And then pour a little soda over it. And there you've got a beautiful summer drink. To make the strawberries that we made to go on top of the shortcake, we just sliced some fresh uh, washed strawberries, took the hull off, sliced them. I use about two tablespoons of sugar per cup of fruit. The sugar draws out the fluids from the strawberries and make the berries soften a little bit and become even sweeter. I like to let them soak for about 30 minutes or you can even let them sit in the refrigerator overnight. Uh, then you'll have plenty of juice to put on some shortcake or put with some yogurt or oatmeal. What's your favorite way to eat strawberries? I like strawberry shortcakes or 
eat them straight out the field. Do you really? Yeah, you just I love pick them and pick eat them. Pick them and eat them. Oh. I know, but you need to wash them though. No, <laughs> right. Good, good, good. Food safety. We need to wash our berries first. I appreciate y'all coming out here. We're at Harris Farms in Springfield. Let's taste these strawberries. Beautiful strawberry. Boy, they sweet and juicy, mm -hmm. huh? Mm -hmm. Did you know that botanists call the strawberry a false fruit? The popular strawberry is not a berry at all. A strawberry is actually a multiple fruit, and the specks on the outside, what we normally think of as the seeds, are the true fruit, called akines. The strawberry has around 200 of these tiny individual fruits with a single seed inside, and they are all embedded in its fleshy and tasty stem tissue called the receptacle. So we're out here in one of your beautiful strawberry fields. Um, can you tell me more about uh, these plants here? Uh, how long have you been growing these? We start. We put these in the ground in September and started picking them at the end of November and December. Um, they got flower, these flowers right here. That turns into a strawberry. It takes 21 days if the, te if the temperature's right and the ideal um, situation for this flower to turn into a strawberry. It comes out the, the middle of the plant uh, this growth, this plant comes in about this big and it steady grows as the season goes. It's steady shooting out crowns and blooms. So as long as you're fertilizing the, the plant the way it needs to be fertilized and it's getting the amount of uh, water and nutrients, it does good. When we have a lot of rain and stuff like that, it puts stress on the plants and, and they'll, they'll start slowing down for us. We don't want any rain at all. Uh, water's very bad for strawberries. Um, it's just, uh, we like to run, we have drip irrigations down these rows and we like to be able to maintain and manage the water appropriate. Too much water is bad. It makes the plant, uh, makes the strawberry real, real, real soft and it starts to, to uh, have issues quick as far as mildew and other stuff. You mentioned that you grow the strawberries over, over the winter time. So how do you protect them from the cold? Do they like the cold? Or? They, they, they like cool weather. Um, cool. Cold doesn't hurt them. We have hoops that go over this and then we have cloth that comes down the middle and we cover six rows at a time and then put sandbag and then you know when it gets down to 38 degrees or lower we have to have do this for frost uh, control because frost will burn that bloom up and then it takes forever for the bloom to come back through the middle. Can you show me uh, what does a runner look like on, on one of these plants? This, this is a runner off of that plant right here. This comes off so these are runners. These plants are steady producing runners and crowns and, and berries, which technically, if it has a root system, you could plant this in the ground and, and, and it will, it'll get to be like that. Well, Trey, thank you so much for having us out here today. We've really enjoyed learning more about strawberry plants and how they grow. and. Uh, we want to come back again sometime soon. No problem. I appreciate y'all coming out and thanks for what y'all doing for these kids and bringing them awareness of strawberry farming in Louisiana. And it's a very big deal for Louisiana strawberry farmers. It's a state fruit. That's so it's right. good that y'all letting people know what's going on. I know it's really important. And they say that the, the Louisiana strawberries are the sweetest. Is that right? We got the best in the country. That's right. Hi friends. I'm Crystal Bessie, the Louisiana Farm to School Program Director. This month's Louisiana Harvest of the Month is not a plant or an animal. It's often mistakenly called a vegetable, but it's actually the fruit of a fungus. It's mushrooms. These tasty toadstools prefer to grow in the dark. In fact, they require no sunlight at all. But today, we're going to shed some light on what it takes to get these meaty, nutritious mushrooms from the farm to your fork. wondered why you don't see fields of mushrooms like you do other crops? That's because mushrooms are the most uniquely grown foods in the produce aisle. Mushrooms are considered fungi, and unlike plants, they don't have chlorophyll to help them make their own food through photosynthesis. Instead, they get all of their nutrients through the organic matter right where they grow. 
Most mushroom farming happens indoors year round, and today we're going to follow their journey here at Mushroom Maggie's Farm in St. Francisville, Louisiana. I'm here with Maggie and her husband Cyrus, the owners of Mushroom Maggie's Farm. So how did you guys get into mushrooms? How did you get into farming? How did you choose that? So Maggie, and I, <laughs> Maggie came to me one day and was like, start a farm with me. And I'm like, what are we going to grow? You know, neither one of us have ever farmed before. So we just started researching. So mushrooms were the second most profitable crops and required the least amount of startup cash yeah. for small farmers. So mushrooms are decomposers. And so what they do is they consume their entire growing medium. And for us, it's sawdust. And they consume it with mycelium which is the actual fungus. Mycelium looks like a root system. It How it, however, it is the root system and the tree. Uh, mushrooms are just the fruit body. It's like the, the apple from the tree. Well, I'd love to really take a look at this process. Can we, can we go inside? Absolutely, let's that go. Sounds good to me, let's check it out. So it all begins in this area right here. This is what we call the mixing and bagging area. What we do here is we take hardwood sawdust, soybean holes, and rice bran, and we mix it all together on these tables by hand. Um, we add water to it to bring the moisture content of the substrate up to about 60%. Um, and once everything is mixed together and added together, we bag it in these bags right here. Um, these are mushroom growing bags. They have a little filter patch on there so the mycelium can breathe. Um, but it's a very small micron filter so that contaminants cannot get in or out of the bag. Um, so that only our mushrooms grow inside of here and nothing else. They're steamed for about a full day, basically. And once they cool down in there, we bring them to our lab. All right, well, let's go. Let's see what the next step is. So we are in our lab. This is where all things inoculation happen. So you inoculate the, the grain here um, and, and then these bags as well, the, the fruiting bags. Right. Well, like I said, we can start from a mushroom to the plate, to the grain, to the fruiting block, and we can that all has to take place in here. Because right. it, it's all the only place that it can get it done without being contaminated. Okay, so I've got a bag here that's been inoculated. We're going to take this over to Cyrus in the colonization room. Okay, so it's a little bit warmer in here than it is outside. It uh, is. Tell me a little bit about the colonization room. Um, basically, we take a mushroom, we break it open, and we take a tissue sample out of the middle of the mushroom, and we will put it on, a, on agar and in a Petri dish and it will take about two weeks for the entire, um, for the mushroom, the fungus, to colonize the plate. Um, you, it looks kind of like a spider web. This is a fully colonized bag of grain spawn. And so this is all the mycelium you're seeing in there. Right. You can do 50 blocks, 50 fruiting blocks with, with that one bag of grain. This petri dish right here can make, grow millions of mushrooms. Wow. But here's one that's, let's see, a couple weeks, uh, about a week old. And you can start seeing my yeah, Just a little bit there. Just starting yeah. to spread out through here. Um, then here's one that's a little bit older. See, they'll, they'll turn completely white for the most part. The, the mycelium itself will get very thick. Um, I see. And that's the, the fruiting blocks telling us that they're ready to fruit, basically. So once they're ready to fruit, we bring them into our fruiting room. Everybody wants to see that one, so yeah. I'll show you, come on. Okay. I want to learn a little bit more about fruiting, but before we do, let's visit Judy and see what she has cooking up in the kitchen. Hi, I'm Judy Myhan, instructor in the School of Nutrition and Food Sciences at LSU. I've loved edible mushrooms since the first time I tried them. My father would grill a steak and then my mother would add the mushrooms. In my kitchen, mushrooms make an A+. Nutrition's very important to me as a teacher of nutrition, and mushrooms are very nutrient-dense. And what nutrient-dense means is that they deliver a lot of nutrients, very few calories. So that means it, it's great to add them to your diet. 
Now, one thing I want to make sure you know is not all mushrooms are edible. Some can make you very ill if you eat, eat them, so make sure that a knowledgeable person has identified them as edible. So I always tell people not to wash mushrooms. Um, they already have a lot of moisture inside of them, so they can end up getting waterlogged if you do anything like that. Um, and you also don't even really need to wipe them down, especially anything that you buy from us. They're all grown indoors in a controlled setting, so you don't really have to worry about that. They're, they're kind of good to go. Right. Well, I know they're full of water, and that's yeah. something that when we're cooking with mushrooms, we have to keep in mind and that is that they are 90% water. Right. right. And if you want them to brown, you've got to take a lot of care. Uh, Alan and I were talking about it earlier, about how you need to have the temperature really hot if you want them to brown. Yep. Um, and to be careful not to add any salty ingredients early in the cooking process, because that draws the water out. Correct. Unless you want to draw the water out, which is what we did when we made this mushroom jerky. That looks awesome. Isn't it? Can you smell it? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so we we did salt it. So think about that as a great snack, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have an abundant harvest of mushrooms and you don't know what to do with them, one of the things you can do is make mushroom jerky. So another thing that I did to cook mushrooms was I uh, roasted them. Mm -hmm. So I heated the oven up to about 425. Nice and hot. Again, I put them on a, a pan, separated them really well, put some shallots in there, and roasted them. Oh man, yum. That is really good. Oh yeah. So the mushrooms that I used for this were the oyster, the gray oyster mushrooms. Right. And all I did was tear them apart and put them on the baking sheet with some oil and a little bit of soy sauce and uh, put them in the oven, baked them for about 15 minutes. It didn't take very long at all. I did slice a few shallots in there, but they're delicious. Simple, easy to make, great tasting. One of the things that we did is we experimented with using mushrooms and mixing them in with rice, uh, making it sort of jambalaya style so that it, the mushrooms gave it a real meaty flavor and everybody really enjoyed it. So that is our Harvest of the Month recipe that is available for people to use in the schools. If you want to try mushrooms, please get out. Saturday morning, every Saturday, 8 to 12, we're downtown, Baton Rouge. And we will give you some mushrooms to take home and try. All right, very good. So now we're going to go to the fruiting room where Crystal will be learning a little bit more about growing mushrooms. So here we are in our fruiting rooms. So this is where the blocks come from the colonization room. We bring them in here to the fruiting rooms where we do a temperature change. So the temperature goes down, it gets lower and colder, and then we increase the humidity, which means we just putting out, spraying water in the air with a, with a misting system. And we have uh, many different varieties of the mushrooms in here. When you right. think mushroom, you think earthy flavor, that's the umami flavor. So umami is like the fifth basic taste. And exactly. it, it yeah, technically right. means delicious. But right. Thank you so much, Maggie and Cyrus, for having us out at Mushroom Maggie's Farm today. We really appreciate it. I know that I've learned so much, and uh, so thanks for giving us the tour. No problem. Thank you for coming out. Hello everyone, I'm Martin McConnell. I am a longtime supporter and friend of LPB and I want to thank you for joining us today. You are watching Louisiana Harvest of the Month. This is a special broadcast of LPB's digital series and that's in collaboration with the LSU Ag Center and the Seed Success, the Louisiana Farm to School program. Now, support for this type of storytelling uh, comes from you in addition to the LSU Ag Center, but we need your support by calling 888-769-5000 or text GIVE to 888-769-5000. You can also just go online to our secure server at lpb.org or you can scan the QR code that's on your screen right now. 
And when you call right now, your contributions will mean twice as much to LPB, and that is thanks to the generosity of Patricia Alford, Angela Corvers, Terry English, Neil Ferrari, and Andrea Stafford. These are good friends of LPB, all from the Greater Baton Rouge area, and they have gotten together to challenge all viewers, meaning you, during this program. They're going to match your contributions dollar for dollar up to the first $1,500. So to thank you, let's take another look at the incredible gifts that we have available for you during this broadcast. For a $20 monthly donation, you will receive the Louisiana Harvest of the Month combo that includes the LPB Picnic Blanket, a pair of LPB Insulated Koozie Beverage Tumblers, locally produced honey from Fullness Farm, and a three-pound box of fresh-shelled Bajoran Pecan Halves. For $10 per month, receive a three-pound box of Bajoran Pecan Halves, or for just $7 per month, receive the LPB Picnic Blanket. You may choose not to receive a gift to let 100% of your donation go to support LPB. Simply call or text GIVE to 888-769-5000, give online at lpb.org, or scan the QR code on your screen with your smart device to become a friend of LPB today. And we are back in the studio with Dr. Carl Motzenbacher. He is the Seeds to Success Louisiana Farm to School Program Executive Director. And joining him also is Crystal Bessie. And she is the Program Director. Welcome back, guys. And uh, so this is a program uh, ostensibly all through the LSU Ag Center. What, what inspired the LSU Ag Center to develop a program such as this? Well, we wanted to kind of bring an experience that um, some of the kids wouldn't be able to have in the classroom or may not be able to go to a farm to visit and find out where their food comes from. And so we wanted to bring that experience not only to classrooms, but also to anyone, um, a young or old, to watch these videos and learn a little bit more about all the gifts that Louisiana has to offer and um, know where your food comes from. And we just wanted to offer a different perspective of how foods are produced and uh, find out um, what happens in the state. How do we get these products from the, from the farm to your plate? And, and this is a great series, this Harvest of the Month series, which you're the host of. They're small videos. They're available online. They, people can watch them at their schedule rather than waiting for the program. So it's there all the time. So th this is just a great, uh, a, a great program. If you want to see it, uh, LPB now has this LPB digital series, and you can watch it uh, at lpb.org slash lpbdigital. That's the way you can watch all of these programs like the Harvest of the Month. You can see Nourish. You can see Good Gumbo. Uh, a lot of great programs like that. So, so make sure that you go online and see that. Um, but right now, let's take another moment. I just want you to take a quick moment and see some of the great thank you gifts that are available for you when you call 888-769-5000 or go online to lpb.org. For a $20 monthly donation, you will receive the Louisiana Harvest of the Month combo that includes the LPB Picnic Blanket, a pair of LPB Insulated Koozie Beverage Tumblers, locally produced honey from Fullness Farm, and a three-pound box of fresh-shelled Bajoran Pecan Halves. For $10 per month, receive a three-pound box of Bajoran Pecan Halves, or for just $7 per month, receive the LPB Picnic Blanket. You may choose not to receive a gift to let one 100% of your donation go to support LPB. Simply call or text GIVE to 888-769-5000, give online at lpb.org, or scan the QR code on your screen with your smart device to become a friend of LPB today. So Crystal, I wanted to ask you, I mean, you're the host of Harvest of the Month. Um, what were, were there any some surprises or fun facts that you learned in, in helping to put this series together? Well, honestly, I learned so much making these, these videos and I had a great time doing the research and meeting these farmers. Probably the most surprising thing I found when I was researching uh, the videos and these crops are the historical figures that are connected to the crops and why we grow them, um, such as the, the strawberries with the Hungarian settlement and um, the Jesuit, Jesuit missionaries and the citrus in South Louisiana and George Washington Carver with sweet potatoes. So there, there's so many different aspects and so many different things that we wanted to put in these videos. And 
um, we just really enjoyed putting them all together and, and sharing that information and I hope that someone everyone learns a little bit of something in, in out of our videos and and there's just such a wealth of information dr. Matzenbacher the how many I mean what kind of veggies are we talking about what what are some of the vegetables that we can look forward to learning about in the harvest of the month series well the next one is going to be mushrooms and then we are looking at um, a number of other crops catfish is going to be an exciting one coming up tomato summer squash and then rice so those are the next ones that we and, have and so each each program is focused on one item one particular thing and you can you can see it at lpb.org slash lpb digital and watch it at your leisure and while you're watching it you can sit back and take comfort in the knowledge that you help to make this happen by calling in 888-769-5000 and making your pledge of financial support and if you would do it right now while this program is going on we're having a member challenge going on and we have uh, our members from the greater baton rouge area patricia alford angela corvers terry english neil ferrari and andrea stafford they have gotten together and they have said that they will match up to fifteen hundred dollars a dollar for dollar everything that you put up when you call in and make your pledge of financial support now so take this final opportunity to do this enjoy the great pro programming that LPB has to offer for you the local programming that is only found here on LPB and it's only found thanks to your financial support and the support of the experts in the state of Louisiana who have agreed to come on board and share their knowledge and their their passion for what they do and we thank you so much for being here uh, it has been a pleasure I know everybody's going to be enjoying this L why don't we why don't we go out and look at some of the great thank you gifts that you can enjoy for making a pledge of financial support and thank you for being friends of LPB for a $20 monthly donation, you will receive the Louisiana Harvest of the Month combo that includes the LPB Picnic Blanket, a pair of LPB Insulated Koozie Beverage Tumblers, locally produced honey from Fullness Farm, and a three-pound box of fresh-shelled Bajoran pecan halves. For $10 per month, receive a three-pound box of Bajoran pecan halves, or for just $7 per month, receive the LPB Picnic Blanket. You may choose not to receive a gift to let one 100% of your donation go to support LPB. Simply call or text GIVE to 888-769-5000, give online at lpb.org, or scan the QR code on your screen with your smart device to become a friend of LPB today.